Awesome. Okay. Well, it looks like there's some folks joining in. So why don't we get started? Um, first, I would like to say welcome to come for coming today. Uh, my name is Rachel Oxner, and I'm the Marketing Communications Officer here at Perennia, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. So today we're actually going to be trying out a new format for a webinar that we're calling Cover Crops Ask Me Anything. And on our panel today, we've got Sunny Murray, Caitlin Condon, and Rose, Rosalie Gills Madden, who I'll turn it over to in a few minutes to introduce themselves. <clears throat> if you're hoping to get continuing education credits in order to receive off-cap funding, please make sure that you sign into this session with your name so we can verify that you were indeed at this session. And uh, now I'll go over a few basic ho Zoom housekeeping. So all of your cameras and micro microphones have been turned off. Um, you can please keep an eye on the chat function. Uh, Lindsay Scott, Perennia's off-cap agricultural technician, will be posting links throughout today's session, some additional resources for you to check out. Uh, and we really thank you all for submitting your questions in advance through part of the registration or through social media. Um, we've got some great questions and I'm excited to dig in. But if you've got some other burning questions that come up, please feel free to use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, um, or pop things in the chat. Excellent. So with those question, those housekeeping items out of the way, I will turn it over to the team to introduce themselves. Hi there, Sunny Murray. I look after uh, strawberries, highbush blueberries, and raspberries uh, based out of Kento. My name is Rosalie Gillis Madden. I'm the On Farm Climate Action Fund Technical Project Manager. I operate here in the Valley, but I cover Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm Caitlin Condon. I'm the field crop specialist and uh, based out of Kempel, but uh, servicing the whole province. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, so let's jump into the first question if we're all ready to go. Uh, Caitlin, this one's going to be for you. So uh, a dairy farmer submitted this question and they are asking, what is the best way slash most bang for your buck method of getting into cover crops? Money is tight and people are hesitant to try new things. What should you try first? And how do you show results slash measure success? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that the low hanging fruit um, in a typical dairy rotation would be after your cereals. Uh, you have quite a bit of time after you've harvested to be able to establish something. And if you throw in oats or even an oat pea mixture of some sort, that's pretty cheap and pretty easy. And um, so I, I think that's a really great place to start. On the uh, side of how to measure it, that's, that's where things get a little bit trickier. But um, I mean, especially where in fields that you've seen erosion before, um, that's a really easy visual way to look and, and see that you're making a difference. Yeah, I like to think of oats and like fall rye as kind of like your gateway drugs for cover crops. <laughs> yeah. And oats and peas being another one, they're, they're all pretty easy to plant, they're pretty easy to establish. You're likely to see success the first time you try it. There's not a huge, not a lot of drawbacks, like you're not gonna have weed problems, you're not likely to have pest problems as related to that. Um, Residue too from those <coughs> cover crops. Uh, outside of rye is uh, pretty easy to manage. Yeah. When you're, you're planting into it. Yeah. 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 And your oats and peas, that's going to winter kill. So you don't have to worry about terminating it specifically. It's just going to take care of itself over the winter. Yeah. And after your silage corn comes off, um, you know, it's a great time for fall rye to go in uh, in your dairy rotations. So, you know, you've got a really good window there typically. Yeah. And then measuring success. So, like ground cover. <laughs> Cover, you know, yeah. ground cover is kind of like where you should be at if you really want to kind of get dorky about it, like I like to do. I also <laughs> like to dig up the cover crops and look at the roots because uh, that's where a lot of the exciting, uh, more stable organic matter is forming. And you and you know, good root structure is a sign of a, of a successful and happy cover crop, which is you know, good things uh, for your farm and your soil. Yeah. The other thing, it's not really a, a benefit, but I would say just to keep things kind of level is that if you are you're not seeing any yield uh, drags, I guess. So you start incorporating these cover crops into your system. Over time, you may see yield increases, but I think the important thing that some people worry about is the yield drag. And, and that's a good measurement is if you're not seeing that, why not? Yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. Awesome, that's great. Thanks so much. So 
Uh, we'll move on to the next question, but I also will mention that uh, Lindsay did post a resource to a video on cover crops in the chat there. So make sure you check that out, which will go along with the answer there. So this one's for Sunny. So a producer is asking, what are good cover crops that I can grow in the years that I am giving my strawberry fields a break from strawberries? Uh, this person's goal were both breed, weed control and a natural fuming it. Yeah, so everybody's growing uh, strawberries in a little bit of a different system, so it's hard to answer specifically, but, um, and we're not sure how long he's leaving that field out for. Of course, when you're working with strawberries, the uh, longer you leave that field out, the better, but I have a lot of growers that are going back-to-back -back strawberries, so, um, you know, we've got to deal with all situations. The thing you want to think about, uh, though, is uh, your herbicide, so when you're growing strawberries, you have a lot of Simbar use. Uh, the last chance to put that Simbar on is in uh, uh, the spring uh, as you take your straw mulch off, but that can still affect your uh, cover crops uh, going into uh, fall. So I think it's important to uh, terminate your cover crop right off uh, soon, sorry, terminate your strawberry crop as soon as you can. That way you're getting uh, rid of a lot of uh, insect pests and uh, Arthritis and arachnose uh, source. So as soon as you're done picking, I want you out there terminating that. Uh, hopefully you didn't put Sinbar on in the spring. Uh, you can go right in with a fall rye crop. And uh, you know, you can plant that in August and that's fine. That's going to overwinter uh, for you. Uh, I like that just because we're, we want to put a lot of organic matter back into the system and also build soil structure. Um, so I really want to improve uh, internal drainage on that soil, build some soil uh, structure, soil organic matter. And then the next year I'm looking at how can I control uh, pests in that system? So you're looking at the nematodes. So whenever I talk about nematodes, I'm thinking uh, 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 a mustard. So I can go through that bio uh, fumigation system. Um, that's only gonna take a little bit of time. And then I'm gonna put in a, uh, sorghum sedan grass after that. So you're kind of covering a lot of things. The other thing that the uh, mustard is going to control for you is uh, verticillium, which is a big problem with strawberries. So I said a lot there. Just to review, what I would do is start at Christmas time, put your chateau on, then skip your sin bar in the spring. As soon as you finish harvest, you can start with your cover crops. I can get a, a rye in or a mustard in right after my strawberry crop. Next year, if I'm not going back into strawberries, which I don't want you to do, I can go in with a, a mustard first thing in the spring uh, and then go to a sorghum sedan grass. And uh, then I can uh, look at another crop or back into strawberries after that. So if you're gonna be planting rye or brown mustard after the strawberries are terminated, like that's going to be August, so pretty dry. So drill rather than broadcast, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're looking at a dry period of time there. Um, and the other important thing is if you put mustards in that time, anytime you do the uh, biofumigation and you're targeting nematodes, you want to be turning that in when nematodes are at their peak populations. Mm -hmm. So if you look at nematode populations early in the year, you got a peak in the spring and then you got another peak in the fall. So if you can target that fall window with a uh, summer planting mustard, but to answer your question directly, yeah, if you can uh, drill it in much better than, uh, than uh, broadcast at that time of year. Awesome, thank you very much. So Rosie, this one's for you. Um, this person asks or says, we produce field grown vegetables and are looking to include three years pasture for grazing beef into our field rotation. My concern or this person's concern is around creating wireworm problems as a result of placing the field into pasture for three years. Uh, is there any way to manage or mitigate this concern? Uh, that's a great question and probably stems from the, uh, the Federation, the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture is doing um, a Living Labs project that's based on this concept of uh, giving your soil a break, getting some long-term pasture in there, building some organic matter into soil structure. Uh, but one of the challenges that we're, uh, I guess we get worried about, we haven't tested out the system, is those wireworm populations. So the adult of the wireworm is a click beetle. 
Uh, and so the adults lay their eggs. They really like to lay them in sod, which would be a pasture. Um, and then when they hatch, they're in the soil for five years. So, uh, and can create a lot of problems for transplants, for carrots, tomatoes, even some your field crops. Mm -hmm. um, so when thinking about this, if you're gonna be terminating your pasture, like before you go into your hort crop, so I would terminate the pasture, say first week of August, which would give you enough time to get a brown mustard in there. So brown mustard and buckwheat are really great at uh, controlling wireworm. There's not a lot of chemical control, so you gotta look at your cover crop, um, kind of like a cover crop to control. So I would get, terminate that pasture, try to get a brown mustard in that second week of August, which should give you lots of time for it to flower when the wireworms come up in that uh, soil profile. So wireworms and nematodes are kind of similar in that they don't really like it hot and dry, they like it cooler and damper. So like we see these populations come up in the soil profile uh, in the spring. Uh, so for wireworm here in the valley, it's like the first week of May, they come up and then they go down uh, late June. Um, and then they come up again mid-September and they kick around for about a month uh, until around late October and go down again. So if you get that brown mustard in after that pasture, it should be blooming right around mid-September when your water and populations are peaking, mash it in. So you wanna like break up those stems so that you release those fucosinolates, uh, which is like mustard gas basically. So um, you incorporate that into the soil, cap it, and that should help control that water worm population uh, in that fall. And then because I'm really worried about it, I would follow that up the next spring uh, with another um, control method. So uh, you could do brown mustard again in the spring. So how early would you say you'd see brown mustard? So it's going to be like what, eight degrees, 10 degrees? Doesn't really... You can go earlier than that even. You yeah. Can, if you look at canola, mm. canola you can plant as early as you want. Yeah. So I'm um, mid-April. Okay. I'm right there the mustard. Cool. All right. Well, there you go. So then you could put your brown mustard in. Uh, in mid-April, maybe as early as that, depending on when you get on your field and go like that sort of stuff. Um, but ideally with that pork crop following that pasture plow down, if you could delay your planting until the end of June when those wire populations start to go down, like that's when I would target that plant base to plant like a later, um, like a later brassica or, you know, a, a late maturing brassica, the, one of your later seedings. Um, that's what I would do. Long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that was awesome. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and this next one uh, kind of relates to the last question. So uh, do I'll open it up to the group, but maybe for you, Rosie. Um, do cover crops create a soil environment that is more conducive to pest pressure? And how does that, that impact the use of seed treatments for corn and soybeans? Yeah, good question. I'm sure we all have lots of opinions. <laughs> so it totally depends on your cover crop, right? So like something like brown mustard uh, would be great for controlling nematode, for controlling fireworm. If you are in a brassica rotation, I would worry because it could host bug root. Um, some of your other cover crops, so like your legumes can host white mold. Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily use a legume in a when you're going into soybeans. When yeah. you're going into soybeans, particularly yeah. like hairy vetch. Yeah. Um, and then other white mold hosting ones would be like sunflowers. I know people like to put sunflowers in their cover crop mix. Personally, I find it a waste of money. I don't see you know, opinions on that. They're pretty. They're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so let's see, other pest pressures. Yeah. So I mean, over time, your cover crops in your system are going to contribute to your soil health and increase the diversity of organisms in that soil. So that's going to have beneficials, but also some of those uh, problematic pests. However, because you have a healthier soil, then theoretically your crop is also going to be healthier and be able to um, withstand some of those pressures as well. So hopefully it should balance itself out. I think what you want to be careful of is um, like the green bridge. So if you're not terminating until spring, or if you're trying to plant green or something like that, then you've got that green bridge that's going to allow some of those pests to um, go through to the next crop. Um, so I think you want to pay attention to terminating, and I think you uh, want to pay attention to scouting and make sure that you are scouting because you may see some pests that you wouldn't normally see, especially um, in the spring, in the cool, damp soils, like things like slugs um, are going to show up a little more than maybe they or army worm um, can show up more than maybe you would have been used to. 
one thing I was going to point out was uh, if you have a lot of grass there, you're going into corn, and sometimes that grass is attracting to cutworms and armyworms. And, uh, certainly easy to get around as long as you plan for it. And, uh, Caitlin had talked about the uh, traits and the BT tables of, of the different traits on the, on the corn. So make sure you're picking the right traits and you shouldn't see a problem with, with your armyworm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm still, I'm not seeing any questions or anything in the chat yet. So why don't we just move into the next section, which is the lightning round. So we're gonna do two of these throughout the um, webinar today. And I'm gonna ask a specific team member, um, sort of a quick question, and if you can answer it within 30 seconds to a minute, that would be awesome. Of course, if you need more time, I'll, I'll allow it, but, but, uh, <laughs> but let's try to keep, it to keep them a little rapid fire. So Caitlin, you're first up in the lightning round, which is what species do you recommend to broadcast into corn at the six to eight leaf stage? This person has kind of asked a question around hoping for soil erosion protection and to build soil organic matter. Yeah, I think annual ryegrass is a great choice at that point. Um, it's gonna provide quite a bit of root structure, uh, so great for erosion and uh, establishes fairly easily. Great choice, legume. Okay. Uh, clover, red clover, you could do a mix of the two. So I think Lindsay's going to post an awesome YouTube video you just did. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Ah, that's in the chat. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, and Caitlin, would your answer, answer change for that if it was silage corn versus grain corn? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, especially with the grain corn. Um, you really do have to get something in early because you're not going to have the time to establish it after it's harvested. Uh, you have a little few more options, I guess, with depending on when you get your silage off. If you get it off fairly early in September, mid-September, you might be able to play with some other things. But now for interseeding, I'd, yeah, I'd stick with annual ryegrass and clover to start. Right. <clears throat> Sunny, have you seen anyone succeed with sun hemp as a cover crop in Nova Scotia? Yeah, I have a little experience with uh, sun hemp. I've never seen anybody grow it more than once. <laughs> that kind of tells you where, it, a lot. <laughs> where what I think of it. Um, I don't want to discourage people from trying it. So I think you have to recognize that sun hemp is a tropical plant. And okay, so we grow uh, pearl millet and uh, sorghum sedan grasses, which is also a tropical plant. But I think this species just really loves the intense heat. So if you look to areas that are growing sun hemp, if you look to Florida, they're planting it in April, right? So what's the temperature in Florida in April? I don't function in that kind of temperature. So it's, it's 30 degree kind of weather. Um, you need to inoculate it, which is important to remember. So if the seed supplier doesn't provide you uh, an inoculant, it takes a, a specific species to get the uh, nodules going. It can produce you a lot of biomass and a lot of nitrogen, um, but uh, so you need to inoculate it. Um, you need to plant it late. Don't plant it early. It'll just come up and try and decide whether to live or die on you. So it needs to go in late June uh, and it's gonna terminate uh, as soon as you get that first frost on it. So if you wanna play with it, don't, Put it in a pure stand. I think you want to have other species in there to back you up. And, uh, don't uh, hang your reputation on. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I suspect that was over a minute, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, Caitlin, this one's back for you. Um, so what cover crops do you recommend planting after corn silage? Yeah, after corn silage, um, depending on when you get it off, I mean, you don't have a ton of time to establish something. So um, fall rye, fall cereal rye would be my go-to there. Probably your only option, really. I'd Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, and Rosie, should you fertilize a cover crop? Great question. Um, so a lot of people use cover crops as catch crops. So they're there to soak up the residual fertility that's left in the field. So like after potatoes, for example, or after brassicas, where there's a lot of nitrogen that's left there, that's what you put your cover crop in for. Um, but for some of your other cover crops, so like your summer annuals, this would be sorghum sedan grass, pearl millet, 
Um, these are crops that you're specifically growing to put on a wacky biomass because they're, they're, you know, making a lot of carbon that you're then going to put into the soil. And if you want them to put on a whack of biomass, you got to give them food to put on that biomass. You don't have to like really put on a ton, but like, you know, if you're looking at 40 pounds, 50 pounds of nitrogen, uh, and then both of those um, cover crops should be mowed once to really promote, uh, at least once to promote root growth. So once you're about waist high, oh, um, put on another 40, 50 pounds of nitrogen, uh, and you're really going to see some really beautiful organic matter being formed. The other one that I would say that's worth fertilizing would be brown mustard if you're looking to use it as a fumigant or a pest control crop because the efficacy of that fumigation effect is based on how much biomass is actually there in the field. Good question for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, these, are to, it's nice. these are supposed to be for it. Never mind. Next, no, 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 I'll allow it. Nitrogen source on your brassicas. You should be using ammonia sulfur. You should be getting a little bit of yeah, sulfur, sulfur right there, and that's going to uh, help make it a little hotter on, yeah. on your uh, on your bio That's totally true. Great point. Worth going. Awesome. Exactly. Next, yeah. next question. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that's the end of that lightning round. But I do have a question um, that came in through the uh, Q and A. So why don't we go to that one next before we start off with the next round of questions? Um, so this participant asks, if you go with a clover and rye grass mix broadcast and fifth or sixth leaf of corn, what pre-merge spray can you use to not hurt the clover? Um, this person's farming on clay soil and presently using convert, converge on a rye grass only cover crops. And they're like, would like to move to some clover in the cover crop mix, but need to get a handle on the spray to use. Yeah, I think converge is still your best option. Um, it might impact your red clover a little bit, but um, overall it's pretty, pretty low um, risk for both the ryegrass and the clover. So yeah, I think converge is a, a good one there. Things you want to maybe avoid um, would be dual uh, Prime Extra 2 Magnum. Great products, but just if, if you're trying to incorporate cover crops into the system, those aren't the, aren't the right ones to go for. Um, and someone's just asking low rate converge, low rate. <laughs> I'll jump in there. Depends on the timing. So I'm a large fan of converge. So I like to cut converge off at uh, spike. So if you're getting up the spike, I like to cut the rate back just a little bit. But uh, even at high rate converge, uh, if, if you're there, you should still be okay. I don't think you need to cut the rate back too much in order for the uh, clover to come through for you. Uh, you still got quite a bit of time to get from spike to uh, four to six leaf when you're going to allow seed to cover crop. Uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks so much. And if more questions come in, I will let us know. But let's get going with the next group here. Um, so, Caitlin, back over to you. Um, what cover crops do you recommend to plant after winter wheat harvest or corn the following year? And this, you can have more than a minute. These are not the lightning <laughs> <Thank you>. round. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I think there's, for winter wheat, you have two kind of directions that you could go in. One would be after harvest, um, putting in something like oat pea or an oat pea radish mix, um, like I mentioned earlier. But the other option that I really like is uh, frost seeding red clover so that you would do that in the spring, uh, early spring. And then that clover is just gonna, it's gonna germinate and emerge and kind of hang out there underneath your uh, winter wheat until you harvest. And then that clover is gonna take off and it's going to provide a really nice uh, nitrogen benefit for whatever crop you have coming next. So often corn, uh, which can, Corn uses a lot of nitrogen, so if you can get some through that red clover, then I think that's a really great option. Excellent. And uh, part two of that question is for Rosie. So what if the next crop uh, after the winter wheat was a vegetable? Uh, yeah, so it depends on what kind of vegetable. So if you have like a fine seeded vegetable, so like this would be your carrots or your onions, where you don't really want a lot of trash in the field, um, I would do something, I would definitely do something that would winter kill. 
uh, or where we have a lot of residue uh, kicking around. So that would be like, you could do a buckwheat, you could do a brown mustard, or we can tease the residue would probably break up enough so that it wouldn't cause a problem for your character, your, um, for your character, for your onions. But if you were doing something that, uh, where you had to, something that could deal with just a little bit of residue, so like, you know, transplant veg, for example, um, you could try something that would leave a little bit more residue. You could try even like hairy vetch and rye, for example, that would be a nice little whack of nitrogen uh, that could go into that brassica transplant crop. Um, and that would probably be pretty successful. Great, and uh, we've got a question that came in live. So um, someone's asking, would those crops work as catch crop if liquid manure is applied after wheat harvest for corn the following year? Yes. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Absolutely. No, I mean having something there to, rather than applying it to bare soil, you have something living that can mop up those nutrients. I think that's great. Yeah. I, I think the key is put the manure on while the cover crop is still growing. So if you put manure on in December, it's probably not going to be taken up by that cover crop. But if you do it in uh, September, October, yeah, it's going to be overwintered by that cover crop. Excellent. OK, well, next question is for you, Sunny. Um, oh, actually, there's a QA. and a Let me just check to see this one. Um, let's just answer this one first. So this one's about, um, do you have any experience with lentils as an alternative cover crop instead of peas for August planting? Um, supposedly, lentils are more tolerant of hot and dry weather. Anyone have an experience with that? I don't. <laughs> Sounds expensive. It does sound expensive. Don't, uh, I don't know offhand. Do you say? Uh, I've worked a little bit with uh, Austrian winter pea, which of course is again uh, another key, but it's it will overwinter for you, which I think is quite exciting. Um, uh, tried it matched up with uh, fall rye or uh, or uh, spring cereal. You got to plant it in August. It's not something that wants to be planted really late and let it establish. Uh, a little bit slow to get growing in the spring, um, but uh, when it does get going, it's pretty impressive and it can make it a nice silage crop for you. You've got the livestock on there. Outside of that, I haven't tried any other lentils. Uh, sorry. Um, I do have experience with some uh, cow peas, uh, the disease on that would drive you nuts. <laughs> not something you want to get rolling in the field uh, for your next crop. Uh, but outside of that, I, I haven't tried a lot of them. It's not a problem. Seems, yeah. seems some fatter bean, I guess. We can call that a lentil. One or two. Fatter bean. But if anybody that's participating right now uh, has tried lentils and has an opinion on it, pop yeah, it in the chat. Love hear about it. We'd love to hear about it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Some more questions coming in live. So why don't we address a couple of those and then we'll get back to our regular, our other questions that were submitted previously. Um, someone's asking, what do you recommend for cover crops to use in pastures? Great question. Um, so we, there was actually a ton of questions about grazing cover crops that came in. Uh, and we kind of felt like it might be its own uh, it might need its own webinar. So we tabled a lot of them, but um, so we, so gosh, cover crops and pastures. I would look at some of your like forage brassicas would be pretty good. Um, it depends on if you are terminating that pasture and planting the cover crop versus um, just try, looking for some like late grazing. Um, there is a really great YouTube video that Katie Trottier put together. She's our uh, beef specialist. Lindsay, I don't know if you have that um, YouTube video to hand about grazing cover crops. If you want to pop that into the chat, that's an excellent resource. Um, yeah, forage turnips. Good seed turnips would be exciting. Yeah, any of your cereals, really. It really comes down to what the situation, what your long-term plan is for that pasture. Yeah, and what window you're looking to address, early season grazing, late season grazing. Um, yeah. Awesome. So a question here, how will the red clover broadcast into winter wheat affect straw har harvest if we need the straw for cattle? Yeah, no, that's a great question and that's a common concern. Um, so we have different species of red clover. You can have uh, single cut 
red clover, double cut red clover, and the single cut is going to be um, not as vigorous as the double cut. So if you are planning on harvesting that straw and that's a concern for you, then uh, if you go with the single cut, then it's going to be a little lower growing and um, shouldn't shouldn't give you any trouble. And um, also, I think go ahead. I, I think you have to look at your stand too. At the time it's coming out of yeah. winter, like if it's a thin stand, you might want to pull back a little bit. But if it's a good stand, go for it. Of the wheat. Oh, yeah. Of the wheat. Yeah. 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 If yeah, if you have a a lot of winter kill or something, then that clover is going to want to fill in all that space that winter killed. So then you're going to have more issues than uh, than if it's just kind of trundling along around underneath. If you look at a wheat crop. Yeah. It's a thick stand yeah. compared to your other cereals. So uh, that stand should suppress your uh, clover as it's establishing. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you get the opposite comment. You know, when you go out there with the combine, where's the clover? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's gonna look <laughs> terrible when you first harvest. That's that's the caveat. Is uh, yeah, it's gonna look all scraggly and like there's not very much there, but then it should, it should really be able to fill in in that late summer, early fall period. As soon as you remove the canopy and let the light in, yeah. they don't come to the end. And so I think Lindsay has posted a link to the YouTube video that Caitlin and Sunny did about frost seeding red clover into winter wheat. And then there's also your excellent podcast yes. of frost seeding red clover into winter wheat if you want to um, access resources yes. that way. And Lindsay, you might have already posted that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, someone else asks, how would you spray wheat if you frost seed red clover? Yeah, so you don't, it doesn't leave you with a lot of options. However, the between the really good wheat cover um, and whatever red clover is in there, you shouldn't have it much issue with spring, um, with any spring ones. But yeah, if you if you spray for weeds in the fall, then you shouldn't see much interference with the uh, with the red clover. So yeah, so like a fall herbicide would really yeah. be what you want to know if yeah. you're going to be cross-seeding red clover. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you have a buck lamb and uh, MCBA, MCBA, so yeah, yeah, they're not great on perennial weeds, but they'll be fantastic on common annual weeds that emerge in the spring. Great, so um, why don't we just jump back into some of the other questions and then there's a few other questions coming in. So we'll just kind of jump back and forth. So this one's for Sunny and it's, what's the recommended latest fall seeding date for cover crop? And how do you determine when it's too late? That's not a lightning round question at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> very, very just dependent on the species you're planting and the, and the system you're in. And I think uh, fertility, plays a role in that too. If you have a lot of nitrogen coming out of the previous crop, well, that can be sopped up by, by uh, the uh, cover crop. It's gonna look a lot uh, more vigorous uh, than if you have no nitrogen in the system at all. So uh, I hate when people give wishy-washy answers. So <laughs> I was gonna call you on that. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, for a legume, uh, and I'm thinking mostly uh, a red clover, I cut it off at August 20th, and uh, that's quite late, but I've, I've gone out uh, in the fall and checked for nodulation on those uh, late seeded clovers, and uh, it's pretty impressive how much nodulation can happen. So August 20th, and keep in mind that these are dates for the Annapolis Valley, and uh, if you're listening from uh, 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 Newfoundland or, or uh, northern New Brunswick, then that's a separate conversation. But, uh, uh, ryegrass, I think uh, September uh, 1st is kind of your cutoff, and again, I'm assuming that there's a little bit of nitrogen in the system uh, to get that uh, ryegrass rolling for you. Uh, tillage radish, it depends on what your expectations are. If you want tillage radish as big as your forearm, uh, you're planting them in August, but I've had guys that put the tillage radish in with their winter wheat, uh, and you end up with something that looks more like a pencil, and uh, you know, I think that's still doing uh, some good for you. Uh, it's uh, carrying over some uh, nitrogen if they have ignore in the system. So uh, cut off for that, in my mind, uh, that's uh, still September 18th. Uh, if you want to be going any later than that, uh, and soil temperature. Um, mustards, uh, me and Rosie, we always have this discussion, but 
there's something about a mustard that uh, you can plant it through August and get a great crop. And then you come to this magical date and anything planted after that, it just doesn't produce. <laughs> and uh, we haven't figured out what that magical date is or what that mechanism within that uh, uh, mustard plant is that, uh, but it's, it's literally a day's difference in the planting. Um, so again, I hate being wishy-washy, so mustards, I'm saying August 20th is the last day you take. Uh, just because I don't know when that cliff, where that cliff is. Um, and then if after those dates, you can still put in uh, winter cereals or uh, spring cereals, depending on what your, uh, what your uh, goal is. And uh, what the weather is like that fall. Okay. <laughs> I mean, not that you can predict that as easily, but you know, if you want to be, if you want to push it a little bit, you might get lucky like this fall and, uh, and be able to get something well established. I was amazed at how late farmers went this year yeah. with uh, winter rye. Uh, they were still seeding well into late November. Yeah. And again, it has to do with what is your goal and what crop you're planting afterwards. Now, obviously that winter rye isn't gonna contribute anything to a biomass or contribute anything to anything when you plant it in uh, late November. Yeah. But if you have time before you're planting your next crop uh, next spring, uh, it's going to come up. Uh, if there's nitrogen in the system, it's going to produce a lot of organic matter. So maybe that's your goal. Yeah. So like a lot of the nitrogen in your soil is lost over winter. So like those are those uh, freeze thaw effects. And so that nitrogen that's being lost is often lost as nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, so if you, even if you do get that fall rye on super late, I mean, end of November is definitely later than I would ever like to see. Um, but that growth in the spring before your cash crop goes in really sucks up a lot of that uh, residual nit um, nitrate, which would then turn into nitrous oxide. So, um, you know, if your goal is a beautiful stand in January, February, definitely don't plant it in November. But if it's suck up a little bit of residual fertility that's happening in early April, then okay. Maybe, but like dates that I like to see here in the valley for fall rye, um, that would be like Halloween is kind of, mm, yeah, really it. it cut off. <laughs> and then Truro, probably a little 10 days earlier. Yeah. Cape Breton, probably what, second week of October for fall rye. Yeah. And so similar to uh, Newfoundland, that'd probably be second week of October, maybe even end of September. Yeah. Again, you're not may not get like a beautiful lush stand, and um, but it'll soak up some of that residual fertility in the spring. And so this fall, we actually put in some demo strips. Um, so stay tuned for more information on those. But we did fall rye. Um, we did four different seeding rates and put them in weekly from uh, end of September right through to mid late November. So we should have some. Some interesting pictures, um, from both from this fall and um, and from next spring. See how those things went. Uh, but I was really surprised at some of like the latest planting. It came up. <laughs> and, yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so um, yeah, so those results will be shared on the Agriculture and a Changing Climate blog. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay, if you could stick a link to the blog there in the chat. Uh, and I'll also go out on crop links. Oh, yeah. Uh, so sure. if you get Caitlin's e newsletter, um, yeah. see it there. Stay too. tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> awesome. Wasn't a quick answer. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. But I'm going to move us along if that's all right, if we feel that one's answer <clears throat> answered. And I'll just remind anyone if you've got any questions, just to pop them in the chat. Um, if you've got something, we just, people's microphones are turned off, so can't hear anyone, but please feel free to pop them in the chat. There is a question that came through the Q&A, so I'll jump over to that, which is how much risk is there to using bin run cereal rye versus buying treated seed for cover crop? Is your rye typically treated? No. Uh, not typically treated, but uh, certified. certified. Certified, yeah. Yeah, so I think your biggest risk there is, is just weed seeds. Um, if you're using bin run, then you might have some weed seed issues. Um, shouldn't be any problem with establishment. Uh, One thing I've noticed is, and it depends on the quality of your bin run and how many generations it is from certified. But uh, when I first came on the scene, uh, we were growing uh, 
been run rye seed that was 20 years old, 20 generations old. And uh, the figure on that, what, and we had no idea because we never saw certified rye. <laughs> so we just thought that's the way rye was supposed to look. But uh, when we uh, introduced some uh, certified rye, the uh, vigor on it was just amazing compared to this uh, stuff that was 20 generations old. So, so probably okay for a year or two, okay or a generation, generation or two, but then you want to refresh with some certified. So the next question I've got is for all three of you. So this person is asking, should I terminate the cover crop in the fall or the spring? Does the answer change depending on what is going to be planted in the spring? Corn, barley, alfalfa, fine seeded veg crop. So this one might devolve into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can tell you what we see commonly, like particularly in veg rotations, a lot of guys will spray the cover crop uh, in November and they leave it as long as they can and they use like a low rate of roundup so that that cover crop dies slowly. Um, and that's typical in a fine season rotation where they really, really don't want any residue. Um, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, I love it. <laughs> um, I would rather see a cover crop still there over the winter, for like, like fall rye, for example, soaking up all of that um, nitrate that could go into being a greenhouse gas. Um, but the thing about cover crops is that there's kind of, there's like what you would read in a textbook that would be great, but then there's like what's practical for your farming system, yeah. so, right? Yeah, I think it totally depends on what your system is and what crop you're going into. Because if you're going into a spring cereal, then you really don't have much time in the spring, plus having that cover crop still living there. Um, it's going to take longer to dry so you can actually get onto the field. So it might be a better choice to terminate in the fall. But when you have a little bit more time, if you're going into corn or something like that, then you can afford that extra time in the spring to kind of let it dry up a little bit and, and to be able to terminate enough in advance that it's not going to affect your, your corn plant. Yeah. You brought something up in our thing with cereals there. <laughs> You know, if you have that cover crop that overwinters on you and then you put cereals in, well, we don't necessarily in cereals have good herbicide yeah. options uh, compared to something like corn where you have uh, Roundup in your back pocket and it's the great equalizer, right? Um, I was going to take the uh, flip side of this coin and say I like your brown dirt come spring. <laughs> um, totally love cover crops, in the cover crops. But you, uh, you as uh, farm managers or farmers, producers, you have so much to manage in the spring. And I can remember springs where I was down sitting at the, uh, the orchard, uh, the apple blossom parade in my winter coat. And there was <laughs> nothing planted uh, yet in the valley. And uh, so anything that's going to slow down those uh, soils from uh, warming up or draining, anything that's going to prevent you from getting out there with a planter, I'm not in favor of. So get out there with your sprayer in the middle of November and kill those cover crops down. Or, uh, you know, if you don't like that answer, uh, go with a, a cover crop that's going to winter kill on you. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I know you can manage around <laughs> those kind of things, but uh, if, if you want to take the easy route, kill it in the fall. Yeah. And to kind of take that one step further, I'm going to mention planting green, yes. um, which I think is a really interesting option. So your cover crop is, is living and you plant while the, your cover crop is still living and then terminate after that. Um, so I think that that's a cool option. I have a podcast episode on that as well, if you want to check that out. Um, but if you do want to try that, I would try it with soybeans first. They're a little bit more forgiving than, than corn. So Caitlin's podcast, for those who, of you who aren't subscribed, is called Outstanding in the Field. Yes. And that was called Planting Soybeans Green. Yeah, Planting Soybeans Green, yeah. the episode title. Yeah. Great. So we've just got about 15 minutes left for the webinar. Um, so there's lots of questions coming in through the Q&A, and we've still got some that were submitted previously. Um, I'll try to mix in just a bit of both, if that sounds okay to you guys. But um, one person 
is made a comment just about um, that John Grabber of the University of Wisconsin has been running a trial of interseeding alfalfa into corn silage with planting dates separated by a week max. Um, and someone was wondering, and that same person's asking again, would the alfalfa take here in Nova Scotia or would the corn stalks be broken down next spring enough to mow? Hmm, any thoughts on that? I suspect they're in a corn silage situation. Got feeling. They're probably also working with Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Kind of mm. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. And you got to remember when you look at these trials that are done in Pennsylvania, they've got another month to work with. So yeah. You got to keep that in the back of your mind. Very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the person did type in and just said yes. So answer your question there. Yeah, that is the situation. Sounds like an on farm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to you next winter. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, really cool. Like you're, you're yeah. playing with some special crops there too, Zola. Yeah, you want to go in with, into it with uh, and all your ducks in the row, I think. I'd love to see somebody else try it first. Yeah. <laughs> on farm now. I'll do it. The, right other, down. the other thing that comes into my mind is uh, the wheel graph itself when you're harvesting. Yeah. So that's going to be a bit of an issue. But, uh, so pick a farm with flotation mm. equipment, mm -hmm. wider tires are better. I don't know. Sounds mm. awesome. Yeah. Uh, if whoever asked that question wants to try it, put your name and email into the chat, and Lindsay <laughs> will write it down, and then we will call you yeah. and uh, see if we'll we can get in touch. It. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome, that would be great. Um, so I will jump back to our other questions. So this one's for you, Rosie. Um, Multi-species cover crops are all the rage right now, this person writes in, um, with some producers incorporating 15 or more species. Uh, this person said they've seen research from Penn State, however, suggesting that the multi-species benefit plateaus at three or four species. So their question is, do any of you have direct experience with or have seen research on whether or not these complex mixtures are worth the cost and hassle? And also, do you know that have the ideas on the best way to get the seeding depth right if the mixture has a wide range of seed sizes? Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't particularly love multi-species mix, like the 10 ways, the 12 ways, the 15 ways. I find you're not, you're always going to have something in that mix that's not going to do great. So why are you paying money for it? They all flower at different times or establish at different times. They'll often have weed problems. Like, you know, a two, three, maybe even a four-way mix is kind of where I would draw the line. Um, and that mix should be pretty carefully chosen. So, you know, um, there's a multi-species mix that's got, uh, that I've seen that has sorghum sedan grass in it. It's got sunflowers in it. So those should both be seeded into warm soil temps. Um, and then it also has tillage radish. So like if you're seeding that in the end of May, or even the first week of June, your tillage radish is gonna flower and set seed, um, which then becomes a weed. So you don't want that. Um, so if you seed it later, then your sort of sedan grass uh, and your sunflowers aren't really gonna have much time to establish. So like, um, you know, it all depends on what's in the mix and what your goals are for the cover crop. Because like if you're just interested in biomass, or weed depression or contributing to your organic matter or whatever, then um, there was some recent research done by AFC Charlottetown, and they looked at a whole bunch of different like monoculture cover crops and then a few, two or three way mixes. And they found that um, some of the, like a well-established monoculture cover crop had just as much, if not more biomass than some of the two or three way mixes. So. All depends what your goal is. Yeah. And that biomass is what drives like microbial action in the soil too, right? So like you're basically feeding the soil with you know the root exudates, but also when you plow that that biomass in as well. Mm -hmm. um, as for seeding depth on those multi-species mix, it really depends on um, like soil moisture. You got to get that seed into moisture. Um, so if you're planting in August, you know, you're planting it probably an inch and a half, two inches, two and a half inches down because um, seeds need moisture to germinate and so that's really where you should be putting that seed. So uh, I would echo that is moisture trumps anything else, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the middle of summer. Um, if you're seeding in the spring, I would just look at the species in the mix and 
okay if I got a lot of oats or uh, if, I have a, if I have a dominant species in the blend, then I would see to that depth. That's what I would do if moisture wasn't an issue. Yeah. That's all I can do. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question came in through the chat, and this person's wondering if they spray Sinbar in the spring on their strawberries, how much of a problem will they have with getting fall rye to grow? And if it is a problem, what would they spray in the spring instead? Awesome question. So Sinbar, great herbicide. The problem is it's too good of a herbicide. So um, I'm not sure if you caught my comments earlier is, and I think we really need to concentrate on this is when you're putting um, your straw on in the fall, get a, get a dormant herbicide on there as well. So at that timing, I would put on um, Chateau. Uh, then that's gonna take you through early spring and in the harvest. Uh, and then, uh, so I can eliminate that uh, Sinbar in the spring altogether. If you don't like that answer, cut the rate back a little bit on your uh, Sinbar and still be okay. Uh, if you don't like that answer, um, I'm not quite sure when you're coming out of uh, strawberries. So we have a lot of uh, strawberry varieties now. Uh, your early varieties, uh, if you terminate those right away, you can go in with uh, pearl millet. Uh, and that uh, is quite uh, resistant to uh, injury from uh, cinnabar. Um, but for your late varieties like uh, Valley Sunset and uh, Malina, yeah, you're, you're probably a little too close to your similar application and a little bit too late for your uh, pearl millet. So, uh, yeah, so I would try and eliminate that uh, similar application in the spring uh, if you're going to uh, go in with field crop after harvest. We, uh, we partnered up with Horticulture Nova Scotia um, and got some funding to do a residual herbicide effect on cover crop establishment trial here um, this year. And, um, and we showcased that at our August 23rd cover crop field day. And we'll post the results of that also uh, in our blog, Agriculture in a Changing Climate. Um, so sign up for that and you'll get a little email when, uh, when we put that blog post out. Great, so we've got probably time for maybe one more. I can either go back to the, uh, the list of pre-submitted questions or I can answer one from the Q&A that's coming in. Do you guys have a preference? Q&A, let's say. Yeah. Q&A. Refresh. Okay. And maybe we'll have time for more, let's see. Um, so this person asks, what are some cover crops to avoid if you are broadcast seeding? And what are some cover crops that perform well with broadcast seeding? Because of your timing and soil moisture, I'd say. Your larger seeds, if it's dry, broadcasting, it's not going to work. Um, how's that for an easy blanket answer? Yeah, I was always a big fan of uh, broadcasting because it's quick and easy. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to make cover crops quick and easy because they're not immediately generating you cash, right? Until I started seeing seeding failures when it was too dry. So. Yeah, so I think it depends on your uh, seeding timing, uh, whether you're going to broadcast or or uh, drill it in. But the easy answer is when in doubt, drill it in. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll do another one here from the, the Q and A. So um, someone asks, are there any Atlantic Canadian certified seed growers offering cover crop seed? Uh, there's definitely growers in Atlantic Canada that grow cover crop seed, whether or not it's certified or not. I don't know. A lot of growers sell certified seed, but it may not be grown on farm. Uh, if anybody who's participating in today's webinar is one of those growers uh, and wants to share their contact information, they can post that in the chat. Okay. Cereals is a low hanging fruit. Like there's yeah. a lot of people doing winter rye, um, oats, barley. There's some power brothers on PEI that do uh, ryegrass, but I think they sell through uh, uh, another company. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I don't, I don't know of any. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, there's, as Sunny said, there's some cereal stuff in New Brunswick and PEI, and nothing, nothing in Nova Scotia. 
one more Q&A question, or maybe more if we have a little bit of time, depending on the answer. But um, when tilling in a grass uh, slash cover, clover cover crop in mid-spring in a perennial cropping system, like an orchard or a vineyard, how long before the nutrients from that cover crop are available to the perennial crop? Great question, really good question. Uh, <laughs> it depends on a few things. So your carbon to nitrogen ratio. So like if you have, uh, so say, say it's super grassy and that grass is pretty mature um, and that would mean your carbon to nitrogen ratio would be a little bit higher. So maybe above 40, uh, in which case it wouldn't be available for like a month and a half, I'd say depending on soil temperature and soil moisture. So like the availability of that stuff that gets plowed in, it's a microbial process. So you gotta think about uh, a situation that's beneficial to microbial growth for it to release those nutrients. So situations that are uh, conducive to microbial growth are warm and moist. Um, so if it's more carbonous, I would say it might be drag on over six weeks. If it's super green, super lush, honestly, and warm soil temperatures with nice moisture within a couple of weeks. Great. Um, do you guys want to answer one more? I've got two minutes left till one o'clock. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, keep going. You guys are all right. Awesome. Okay. Um, this one's for Caitlin. So what herbicide should I use in my corn to make sure my pre-emergent doesn't stunt my cover crop? Yeah, I think we mentioned that a little bit earlier, but uh, Converge is going to be your safest bet. Um, Infinity is not bad either. Um, but yeah, just definitely stay away from some of those really great herbicides that we like to use, <laughs> like from extra to Magnum. Acuron is going to be detrimental to your cover crop as well. Yeah. Great. Um, and another one here, um, I think this can be for maybe everyone, but in your experience, what are the three top cover crops for grass and legumes in terms of establishment and persistence in Atlantic Canada? I mean, for grasses, like your, it's your easy stuff, your oats, your rye, um, you know, for persistence, it's annual ryegrass because they can easily become a weed. <laughs> Um, and then for your legumes, you know, um, clover. clovers are easy, yeah. um, widely adopted. Um, peas, also easy, widely adopted. Not a lot of drawbacks to peas. Um, the rest of your legumes, you know, sometimes you get into trouble. Perry vetch can become a weed, can be too much biomass for some farms, but does fix a whack of nitrogen. Um, white clovers, yeah, white and red clover. Yeah. Buckwheat. Buckwheat. Yeah, Good one. Buckwheat That's true. We talked about buckwheat all. Great for no. wire arm control. Good yeah, for peach great. grass management. And short window. We only have a short window. Yeah. Grows fast. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that kind of wraps up. We didn't get to the last lightning round, so maybe we'll have to save that for another webinar in the future. Um, but we're just at the one o'clock mark, so why don't we end it there? Um, and everyone can, you know, there's been some resources popped into the chat. Um, and if your question didn't get answered today, feel free to follow up with any of our team members. Um, but thank you everyone for all the great questions you submitted both previously and uh, during the, the session today. And thanks so much to our panelists. You guys had some great insight into cover crops and we hope this was, was very beneficial for everyone. So thanks so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks.